Suzanne Gabby Inglesby, Associate Director of IU's Institute for Advanced Study. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the first of this semester's Brandon Lectures. We're fortunate indeed to have Dr. Tetua Mamu with us on campus to speak about empowerment, a journey and not a destination, reflections from the pathways of women's RPC. While in Bloomington, Dr. Manu will also take part in the International Education at the, Com at the Crossroads Conference, which is co-chaired by Deborah Cohn and Hilary Cullen, and begins tomorrow. We're grateful for her generous willingness to share her time, expertise, and experience with our students, faculty, and community members. Thank you for joining us this evening to hear some of what she has to say. This semester, IAS Director Eileen Julian is on sabbatical, but we are continuing a robust schedule of programs, thanks in large part to the work of our Communications and Projects Manager, Sina Downs, and our Acting Director, Katie Kulajowski. So thank you, Christina and Katie, for all that you do to further the work of the Institute and expand the opportunities that are available here at IU Bloomington. The Brandigan Lecture Series is made possible through the generosity and foresight of IU alumna Jean Lois Porteous Brandigan, who endowed a fund so that we might bring visiting scholars to campus for interactions that enhance our community's intellectual vitality and exchange, which has been a primary mission of the Institute since its founding in 1981. A native of Franklin, Indiana, Mrs. Brannigan graduated from IU Bloomington in 1934 with a BA in English. She has demonstrated her committed support of higher education in a number of ways, including endowed scholarships and awards at both Franklin College and Indiana University, exemplary service on several college and university boards and committees, Outstanding work with the IU Alumni Association, which was recognized with their Gertrude Rich Award in 1985, and of course, this lecture series. Through this series, we've hosted scholars such as Alondra Nelson, Cynthia Inlow, Eric Asherman, and Tim O'Brien. Many of these lectures are available on our YouTube channel, which I encourage you to check out. Next Thursday evening, along with several campus and community partner units, we'll welcome investigative journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. We're grateful for the ongoing benefits that we reap from Jean Lois Porteous Brannigan's gift, and I feel confident in saying that she would have been quite pleased with our choice of visiting scholar and speaker and fellow IU alumna tonight. Dr. Tetra Manu is Professor Emerita at the University of Ghana and former Director of Social Development Policy for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. She has published widely on development and higher education in Africa, contemporary migration, and women's rights and empowerment. She has practiced law, served on the boards of international and national organizations, has, and has taught and mentored students from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds. She holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in law from the University of Ghana Ligon and the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and a PhD in anthropology from Indiana University of Bloomington. She is a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences and has received other awards, including the University of Ghana's Meritorious Service Award for 2007, Ghana's Order of the Volta Officer Class in 2008, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Sussex, UK, in 2015. Her lecture tonight will focus on the Pathways of Women's Empowerment Research Project Consortium, which brought together researchers from Brazil, Bangladesh, Egypt, Sierra Leone, and elsewhere to examine factors that promote empowerment in women's lives. Please join me in welcoming Tetra Manu. Thank you very much, Suzanne, uh, for this generous introduction. Good evening, everybody. I want to start by thanking um, Indiana University and specifically the Institute for Advanced Study for inviting me to join this prestigious cast of Brannigan lecturers. I'm happy to be back in Indiana. Uh, I have been lucky to come in the weather to that. And uh, thank you for choosing to spend your evening um, with me tonight. So as Susan said, uh, this evening I'm going to be 
reflecting on a large research project consortium that I was part of for nearly six years on pathways for women's empowerment. And as she has said, this was a project that brought together about 60 researchers from countries as diverse as Brazil and Bangladesh. So we do the need to be from Brazil to Bangladesh. But also uh, with uh, researchers from Egypt, India, Pakistan, um, Palestine, Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. And also researchers from the UK and some functionaries from UN Women. Uh, this was a research project that was um, the, the Department for International Development in the UK that we had to bid for and we received additional support from the Norwegian and Swedish governments to explore the contours of women's empowerment in different cultural, economic and political settings to understand the constraints on women's autonomy and agency, which are manifest in several gender inequalities. And this, this project was truly exciting, very interdisciplinary, and allowed us to explore a variety of methods. One of the things we were interested in, for instance, was what do policymakers read? How, how do you get the attention of policymakers? Because we know that typically when you come out with very large research reports, that policymakers are not going to read that. So we, we engaged with, with several people from the world of policy to try to understand not just what they read, but also how they read you know, the start. We also decided that yes, we would, we would do the usual academic thing because many of us were academics, so at the end of it, we needed to publish several papers and books, and in fact, we did get an agreement with Z Press and publish almost 10 books out of the research project. Um, several, we did a special edition of the journal development, and then of course, since the project coordinator was based at the ideas in Sussex, there were several bulletins of, of the ideas uh, magazine that, that was published. So we did all of that. But we also wanted to break new ground. So we also did, uh, you know, we did photography exhibitions, we did films, and, and sometimes we got, it wasn't us doing it, we were doing it with the people that we were working with. So we really, the whole idea of how do we communicate research results was built in right from the start, you know, not as an afterthought. But, so communications was an active part of the research. And it was very experimental, but also we were asking ourselves a lot of questions. We, there was also space for workshops, we used life histories, interviews, we did quantitative survey. We had a lot of money and we enjoyed ourselves. We, <laughs> we really did because we, we went to different countries. So Egypt was often a very, um, you know, it's a nice choice to go to Luxor, to go to Cairo, to Brazil, to Bangladesh, to Ghana, to the UK. We did, actually didn't like going to the UK because it was, it was very cold and we had very small <laughs> rooms to live in, etc. But in all of this, we were concerned to, to really, in fact, in, the, in 2006, we, had a, we, we actually had a whole inception year to, to think through the research. You know? So we were concerned that a lot of things done for women, we call them motorways to nowhere. You know? So uh, we spent a lot of money and at the end of it, there is really nothing to show. So we were really concerned with these kinds of pathways 
And, and when you think of pathways, I mean, motorways are broad, letter. Pathways can be through the bush, you know, the, the meander. We, we, we really wanted to, to break new ground. And as we, we had our own conversations with ourselves, we really spent a lot of time thinking about the whole concept of empowerment. And we called it a buzzword or a fuzz word that it, it often appeared in many development um, uh, discourses and it was very imprecise really what it was. You know. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand the different conceptualizations of women's empowerment. And, and one of our realizations was that uh, in fact, our Brazilian colleague was, one of our Brazilian colleagues was talking about empowerment lights. It's like Coke Zero, huh? the, the no calorie Coke and those things, you know, so you could have light, very light empowerment or real empowerment. And she did, Cecilia did a paper on liberal empowerment and liberating empowerment. It, it had become anything that anybody wanted to make of it, you know. So we, we did spend a lot of time. And for this paper, I drew a lot on, a, on a, an article that Andrea Conwell, who was the coordinator of the Research Project Consortium, did in the Journal of International Development in 2016, where she really does an archaeology of, of, of um, empowerment, and specifically women's empowerment in the literature from its very early liberatory um, understandings associated with Paulo Freire, Paulo Freire and other radical traditions, you know, to a point where it becomes anything, it loses that kind of transformative potential that it has always been associated with. To now become something that the World Bank bestows on women, for example, to micro-credit programs and all kinds of programs that are designed to, to do things for women. Which is not to say that women do not need loans and micro-credit, but it, it is preposterous to think that when you have done that, that you have empowered them. So it was really a plea for, for, for really understanding the, the histories, the different contexts, and the necessity to, to still keep that transformative edge when you talk about empowerment and not reduce it to um, these, these gifts that are, are, are uh, given by different uh, people to, to, and now, you know, you get banks, you get everybody trying to empower women everywhere, you know, so, it's, it's, whereas in the earlier conceptions, it's a lot to do with consciousness raising and, and usually on a feminist or a radical kind, concerned with transforming power relations on the ground. You know, so the whole idea of power, that some people have power and others do not, and that to, to, to be empowered is to um, recognize the inequalities in power and to assert the right to have rights and act to bring about structural changes, not just, you know, you get a little bit of capital and you can, or you raise chickens and therefore you become empowered. And uh, Sri Lanka, actually Wala, who was part of, of uh, she wasn't directly in the research project, but she came to many of our conferences. Um, she, she had argued that the whole talk of women's empowerment was in danger of losing the concept's transformative potential, and that it was important to have a more precise understanding of both power and empowerment. So whereas power was about control of material, assets, intellectual resources, and ideology, empowerment was really a process of challenging existing power relations and gaining greater control over the sources of power. 
So this, this centrality of power and control to the conception of empowerment also takes us beyond the focus on individuals to much more structural uh, conditions. Um, and also um, brings into it the issue of collective action, that often this is not something that individuals can do on their own, but often with other people. So that relational concept of power also comes in. And um, therefore, when we are talking about empowerment, we are really talking fundamentally about shifts in power relations, which really do not come about when you just give women credit to, to do something. It's important, but it does not, it's not enough. You know. So, um, these are, these, we spent a lot of time, you know, discussing, researching these changing conceptions and finding out really how in different programs these ideas then came up. So, the kinds of discourses on women's empowerment that existed within organizations, particularly state uh, bureaucracies, often came out to be very different from these early, earlier um, ideas and um, very much not about what it is that you could do for people, but what they could do for themselves to affect um, themselves and their capacity to act and, and recognize that. And, and we were also concerned with understanding how people make a sense of their own wealth, you know, not, not how it is that uh, it is interpreted from them, for them, how they view their relationships, their assumptions and beliefs, and their practices and values. And these are where the potentially transformation, transformational effects uh, come in. So, we, 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 we thought that it was important to, to reiterate and go back to these kinds of um, ideas about empowerment, which was fundamentally about changing power relations and building critical consciousness for people. And also that um, empowerment then is not an end point, you don't just arrive and you, know, you wave goodbye, but that it is a process and it can be temporary. And sometimes there are slipbacks, and I think that uh, for all of you in the United States now, with what has happened with Supreme Court justices and the, the, the fear that some of the gains that have been made in the past can be lost through whether a Roe v. Wade you know, stays or not, I think that you can relate to these kinds of, of debates. And in, the, in my abstract, I also um, mentioned the Me Too movement and the fact that you know, women who are empowered, otherwise in, in one area of their lives can be totally disempowered in other areas of, of their lives. And I think that it is, it is sobering that in different societies at different levels of development that these kinds of issues resonate uh, for all of us. Because what it does also is that it, it, it's about building alliances and solidarities across nations to confront uh, manifestations of power. We're talking about power and these are ultimately about patriarchal power in many societies which exist whether a society is highly developed or still developing or underdeveloped. What we also found from our research was that there is no one size fits all when it comes to empowerment in that what some people may consider empowerment may not necessarily be empowering for, for others. So, it was for all of these reasons that we use the metaphor of a journey, you know, rather than a destination, to, to describe our pathways, um, experience that um, it's, it's a journey 
that is often traveled along pathways. And that it can be, we can travel alone, but often we travel better in the company of others because they accompany you, they help you, they prop you up when you're discouraged and, and you, you keep on making uh, the journey. And I think that this, this, um, um, this conception of empowerment is also important because it, it raises the role of what external actors can do in the process of empowerment. Um, I have a chapter in a book where I begin with, uh, I had attended a Bechal Women's History Conference and I was in a room with some women and then they, they, the first thing they asked me when I we found out that I was from Africa. Was, what can we do for African women? And and I felt so disempowered being being addressed like that because it was not an interest in what is going on in Africa. What where where do you come from? What exactly is happening? And how can we help? But it was this kind of you know benefactor. You know what can we do for African women? I went on to ask in that chapter, what is it that anybody can do for African women that they cannot do for themselves? Which is not, of course, to suggest that we do not need solidarity, etc. But that um, to really help people, you have to take off of where they are, understand what they're doing, be respectful of what it is that they're doing, try to understand it, and um, see in what ways you can accomplish. And this was one of the topics of our research as we research women's rights organizations in, in Ghana and Bangladesh and the changing funding regimes, which really has so technicized you know, women's rights organizations that they now spend so much time writing proposals and doing monitoring and evaluation and all those kinds of things. And if you're really smart, then you hire somebody to do all of that and you can get your funding, which doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing the best work. But, but then, and, 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 and what it has done is that it's really disoriented a lot of organizations that started out in a very self-sufficient way, but which have become very dependent along the line and now cannot cope with the changing demands. And we, we, we saw that in our own project because we kept, David kept changing the rules, you know, so you start something and they want, they want you to show evidence of impact. Now, I mean, how you can even say that whatever impacts you are showing are attributable to what you're doing is hard enough. But then often, there's also a very short termism, you know, so within two years or three years, you, you must show impact in order to continue. When it becomes a bean counting exercise, you know, so how many people have done this, etc. And yet we know that in actual life things do not work like that and people draw on all kinds of resources. So part of the work that we were doing, we were looking at uh, mobilizing resources for women's rights organizations and we found that the funding regimes have changed and, and uh, the, the organizations were really struggling to keep pace, you know, so now that they were being expected to do more, they had much less to do it with. And of course, um, part of that was also, some of this work was being done in 2008 when there was a global recession and, you know, there were different pressures on different organizations. But it just, it just, and it just showed, you know, a changing um, technocratic approach, which was very different from the supportive practices that women's organizations have started with, you know, so some of this, so many of the conclusions that we came out with came from the kinds of work that we were doing in, in, in different um, settings. So, um, and, and I already mentioned, for instance, how the World Bank, for example, had taken up the work of some of the people who were in our group, like, like Naila Kabir, who has become very influential, but in the process they had turned it upside down. So it became 
an emphasis on assets and on opportunity structures. So it's almost like every woman an entrepreneur without really looking at the context in which people operated and the specific structures of constraints that they faced, as well as the relationships that they were um, enmeshed in, you know, in the communities and, and families. So, um, one of our conversations was that it was important to build both individual and collective assets and also improve the efficiency and fairness of the organizational and institutional context which govern the use of these assets. And often, these larger structural factors were not taken into account. So what you find in many instances is that you, know, you get a project, it comes in, it lasts for three or four years, and then it folds up. And then if you were to go back five years later, you would not think that anything has happened in that place. It is kind of just jumps in and tries to do that. And then you write your report, and you've empowered some women, but what really happens to them is, is anybody's uh, yes. So we were saying that when you're, particularly when you are working in context of poverty, you, you need to recognize that when you provide women, for instance, with loans, business opportunities, and the means to generate income, you, you, you may be enabling them better to manage their poverty, but you should not delude yourself that you have thereby empowered them, you know, and freed them from the constraints that you have been able to address the root causes of the poverty um, that they face, and that to be transformative, you then need to address the, the root causes of poverty, as well as to begin to address the gender inequalities and other structures that they face. So, um, we argue that it was important as well to produce shifts in consciousness, you know, so that people become aware of what is happening, not just that there's a donor somewhere who is handing out receipts to them, but that this becomes things that they can do, and they can also be allowed to challenge restrictive cultural and social norms and contest the institutions of, um, of everyday life that sustain those inequalities. And the second point was about how to engage with culturally embedded uh, normative beliefs and understandings and ideas about gender power and change in different um, societies. So that ultimately, it is about enabling people to stand back and critically inspect the beliefs about themselves and others that they take for granted, and using this to inform an analysis of what really it is that needs to be changed, that needs to change, and how we can be part of the process of that. And um, when we think about that, then what we are trying to change becomes both at the uh, level of individual change, you know, changes in women's and men's consciousness, as well as changing uh, women's access to resources and opportunities, plus the formal laws and policies and, uh, that exist, as well as the informal cultural norms and exclusionary practices that exist in, in the uh, society. It's also about how you because we know that within bureaucracies that it is not uniform, it's not hegemonic, and um, some of the work that we did was to work with um, people in organizations who consider themselves democrats, for instance, you know, so um, they, they may be located in different government um, machineries. It can be a lonely process, but when they begin to work with others, you know, then they can really um, expand and use those formal positions to advance change. In fact, I have, in, in recent months, I have worried about colleagues in Brazil who were very much involved in some of these processes. And I'm sure um, you are all aware of some of the changes that have been taking place in Brazil as they also try to elect their own Trump and uh, the kinds of challenges that is, is happening. And, 
to sustaining the gains that uh, uh, Brazil managed to achieve over the last 10 or 15 years. You know. So it's also about building collective power because we know that in all of these, all our societies, the different organizations that are working. So how do we really work together to amplify our gains? And last but not the least, how do we imagine women differently? And this is where the whole area of popular culture comes in. And, and I remember that um, one of the um, almost playful um, studies that our uh, Bangladeshi colleagues did was about women watching television and just looking at how other people lived and what it was doing to their own consciousness of their own lives and what could change in their own lives. And it, it also reminded me when I was doing my PhD work on Kenyan migrants in Toronto, I found that um, women watched a lot of soaps, you know, soap operas, and they used that to, to also build up their own ideas of what was not happening in their lives, whether it was ideas about romantic love and how couples should um, behave with each other, etc. And we may think that these are immaterial, but it becomes very important for people to be able to imagine their lives in other ways and begin to strive for, for change. So, especially this, this area of popular culture and how it, it, this is really a kind of um, an enmeshed pro, pro, process because this is where in many societies you this, this, uh, this is how gendered ideas and norms are perpetuated. What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? And it gets reproduced in songs and you know, a lot of sayings. You know, and we found that this engagement with popular culture became very liberating. And in, in our own context, for instance, we engage with songwriters, we, we, we organize song competitions you know, to try to imagine how women could be differently represented in, in popular culture. Now, in terms of what we did in, in West Africa, uh, we were working in three countries, Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. Now, Nigeria is like more than Ghana and Sierra Leone and a whole lot of other countries put together, so it's very popular and very important for Nigeria to, to be part of it. Ghana is a much smaller country, but it is credited with several firsts on the, in the continent and in the South region. And Sierra Leone was a post-conflict society, so it also allowed us to see what kinds of changes are possible once countries emerge out of conflict. And you know, these, these kinds of uh, very, these ruptures produce or provide the space for reimagining social relations and it happened in, in different uh, um, regions. Now, the West African region is a difficult region. It's, it's, um, it's got some poor indicators of development, etc. But at the same time, it's a very dynamic uh, region. So the kinds of, uh, and, um, when it comes to women, um, women have very high labor force participation rates, but they also have very high fertility rates and uh, poor educational uh, attainments and outcomes in many of the countries. And you, you had the case of Liberia, which had a woman, the first woman president on the continent, but it didn't change very much the situation of women generally, and we found that there were very weak gender mechanisms across West Africa generally. So the Pathways program allowed us to conduct research on some common themes to be able to compare the processes of change um, to also see how, for instance, in, in the case of uh, Sierra Leone, how the UN Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security was being implemented. In, in a, to, to bring about change in women's lives. 
So in, in Nigeria, Nigeria has a very big popular film industry called Bollywood, like uh, Hollywood. So Bollywood is the Nigerian equivalent of Hollywood. And it's it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's consumed all over Africa. When you when you take a flight in Africa, you're more likely to watch a Hollywood film than a Hollywood film, etc. But what we, so one of the things that we, um, our Nigerian colleagues were interested in was using Nollywood to explore the kinds of representations of women and, and to have discussion groups with young women to discuss what they were doing so that a critical analysis could ensue because by and large the kinds of representations of women that appear in the films are very negative. So women are witches, they are greedy, they... I don't know how many of you here have watched a Nollywood film, but it's really a popular staple. But it reproduces a lot of, you know, standard ideas um, about women. So our police in Nigeria used a couple of, um, of um, these movies to, to, to stimulate discussion. Now, in, in, um, in, in Sierra Leone, as I have said, our colleagues were measuring the implementation of the UN Resolution 1325 on women, and they found that the implementation mechanism was very weak, that some pillars were, were, there were three pillars of peace, stability, also of women's empowerment, and perhaps not too surprisingly, the pillar of women's empowerment was the weakest one that received um, effort. So we, but nobody had really gone to analyze it and through our own research, you know, we tried to do that, we tried to make popular versions of the resolution to distribute to people so they could begin to even understand what, what it was that um, was being asked to be implemented. And we found that there was really a large gap between the commitment to gender equality and to promoting women's rights on the ground. And that the, the gender infrastructure, the mechanisms for promoting gender equality or women's empowerment issues were also very weak on, on the ground. At the same time, we found that women were emerging as actors in, in Sierra Leone's political landscape because they had played a part in the in the peace processes leading to the end of the war. But as usual, at the end of the war, they would be nationalized and you know, being sent back. And the women's groups had formed a 50 50 campaign to campaign for a 50% representation. Sadly, more than 10 years after they research, the 50 50 campaign has still not seen the light of, of day. We also found in adequate funding for women's rights projects. And then, in, even in the laws and the, and the constitution, that there were still articles that allow discrimination in marriage, divorce, and inheritance practices, all of which made you know, the, the, the kind of rhetorical commitments to women's empowerment really weak and, and, and uh, um, not, not really take a um, strong root. In Ghana, we, we, we did a number of, of studies where we tried to engage with policymakers to really, especially in the Ministry for Gender and Women's Empowerment. Uh, at the time, it was called Ministry of, of Women, Children, and uh, something else, you know, in case of the new year now, to, to really understand what it, how they understood the policy documents that had been promulgated. And we found that in practice they, they didn't really use those policy documents. And they were telling us that, um, well, we're women, so we understand what women want. Or women are mothers, you know, so we do things a certain kind, kind of way. And that often the, the understanding of how it was that policy actually works was not really what was happening. Um, on the ground. At the same time, there were several processes of change that were going on, but not all of them could be attributed 
through the policy framework, quite a lot of it was due to the activities of women's organizations. So for instance, um, we, we had had a spate of murders of women in Ghana from around 1999 to 2001. And we formed a sisters keepers organization and eventually uh, forced the police to be able to apprehend the, the murderers. Over, over a short space of time, about 35 women were killed in one city, and yes, the police were left in different places. And it was interesting because at first it was like, oh, somebody was raping the women, and then when they did the forensics, no way was acting. But it created a real climate of fear for, for all of us, you know. And, and then there were, then, yeah, after that, then we had an epidemic of femicides. There so many men were killed in their lives, you know. So all of that led us now to begin our struggle to pass domestic violence legislation. And interestingly, when we were trying to pass domestic violence legislation, one of our fiercest critics was the then Minister of Women's Affairs who said we wanted to destroy families, you know, and marriages, you know. But ultimately we were able to pass this legislation. And then after we passed the legislation, we then set up a coalition for the domestic violence law to try to monitor how it was being implemented. We realized that passing a law was necessary but it was not sufficient, that resources had to be provided to ensure that things were done, institutions had to be set up, you know, counseling services, etc. And even now, until today, it is still a struggle to do that. So what I'm saying is that you have a policy on, on one side which has been promulgated by government, but then you have the women's rights organizations which were organizing and pushing for different kinds of changes, which then the ministry had to embrace it. Often because it had not originated from them, their uptake was weak and the, the support that was um, we would expect was not uh, very um, strong. And we found that notwithstanding the adoption of gender ministry and women's empowerment, <coughs> that in practice there was limited capacity to see through these things. So much, much was done in the briefs and in the actual implementation, you know, yet we find that Ghana had signed on to so many policies at the international um, level. And one of the things we found was that because women are very active in economic life, there was much more of a focus on women's economic empowerment than on other aspects of, of empowerment. And it was often driven by poverty. And, and what happened then was that, yes, maybe women gained credit or loans economically. Fundamentally, this did not change the conditions of their lives. You know, they were better able to manage their poverty, but you could not say that they had become empowered in any meaningful way. One of the fun projects that we did was that um, Ghana has a decentralization law which is for women to participate in local government structures. And we, we, were, we worked with the women district assembly members to try to understand their, their pathways to power because um, women's representation in politics and decision making is very weak and, and often the explanation was that women were not offering themselves for power, they were not interested as it were. Yet when we work with these women we found out that they were extremely interested in getting into power, that whereas it was claimed that they were not being supported by their families, that their families were very strong supports for them including husbands and children. And what was really holding them back in many cases was that they did not have the money for their political campaigns and, and also the whole political terror tended to be very masculine, masculine and dominated by men. You know, so they saw it as a, as a zero sum game. So why should why should we give space to women? You know? 
So the women were interested, all right, but they were not getting the support. And we worked with them and tried to support them as well as to understand them. And we, we, we were also interested in finding out why we were doing what we wanted to do, why they wanted to be in power, and what were the kinds of things that they did when we were, they were in power. So we, one of the films we made is called Unravels, because um, when, when people are in parliament, they, well, here you don't use titles, but I think in, in the ex-British colonies, you know, titles are very important. So people in parliament call themselves honorable so and so, so the people in the district assemblies also started calling themselves honorable so and so. And sometimes you go to a forum and somebody gets up and they introduce themselves as honorable so and so. So our, our film, which used to be available on YouTube, is called Unravels, and we follow three of these women in try to you know, um, we, we went to their constituencies with them, tried to really situate them in the constituencies where they had come from, understand their, their pathways to, to becoming district assembly women, and what it had meant for them, because they, they really felt empowered, they, they felt recognized, but they also, there was a lot of burden on them to perform and there were expectations of what they should do for their constituents, which was not always easy because these were not people who had a lot of money, but they, they, they helped in different ways. So, for instance, one of the ways that some of the women coped was to um, establish football clubs. They, they didn't seem to do much for the young females in their constituencies, but they did a lot for the youth. When they said youth, Youth was always male, so they established female clubs for them to try to ensure that amenities got to their constituencies. So these many of these were poor constituencies, so they made sure that they got connected to water services or electricity services, um, etc. And uh, we found that when they were elected into public office, they tended to throw themselves into creating projects and providing basic services to their communities. And they found the work of representing their communities deeply satisfying. So it, it went against the grain of women are not interested in political office. We found out that they were. But we found that to succeed in such an environment, they had to be determined, passionate about representing the community, and willing to assist community members, sometimes using their own money to do so. I mentioned the, the, the study on mobilizing resources for women's organizations, which were, was looking at what had happened to women's rights organizations. And we concluded that, yes, indeed, donor resources have played a critical role in supporting women's rights organizing in Ghana, but that the reliance on those resources had also been disadvantageous because it had restricted yeah, it had limited the organizational agendas and, and innovation. And particularly um, um, at, after the Paris Declaration and the whole aid effectiveness agenda, um, it had resulted in new aid modalities and practices, which then really limited what it was that these organizations um, could do. One of the other areas that we were interested in um, when, when we had first met we were, and we were discussing with our Bangladeshi colleagues, uh, we, were, and we were just, so what is it that empowers women? And they said, oh, when? And we said, no, 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 no. In our context, women have always worked, but it has not been empowered. So now we have to get into what kind of work empowers women. So we changed the whole thing from just Work. First we call it empowering work and later we call it decent work, that this has to be work that gives you um, rights, you know, that you should, you, should, you should, it's not just about physical labor, but does it really enable you to, to end up with a pension, with um, um, access to healthcare, etc., you know. And we did a large survey in Ghana with about 600 women, when we were trying to find, to trace changes 
over a generation. So we had um, grandmothers and mothers and daughters, and we were trying to see what it was that had really made a difference in their life. So we were looking at their educational uh, talents, we were looking at their ownership of assets, we were looking at their work opportunities. And we found that indeed the youngest women had the most education, but at the end of it, because the, the, we, we largely have more than two decades of growth without employment, but their education had not translated into better lives or employment work opportunities for them. So um, I think that um, some of Gracia's own work with uh, market women, it became clear that the older women who may not have had much education ended up acquiring more assets because of larger structural conditions than younger women who had no education but who were now working in a much more constrained environment where you, you had uh, jobless growth, if you like. So the younger people with education um, were not getting jobs. And I think that this was not just happening to women this year who were having a situation where there's graduate unemployment and all of those things, not just in Ghana, but in a lot of African countries. So it reflected those kinds of structural conditions. So again, when you talk about empowering women because they have education, but then the education does not provide jobs for them. It shows you what the limits of such empowerment can be. And it was, it was really interesting looking at these um, three generations of women in front of you know, the, the mother generation who had less education had been able to do more than the grandmothers, as well as the daughters. The, the grandmothers who had less education in me, but then the daughters now had more education than the people find jobs. You know, so they ended up with fewer assets and the life. Um, one of the surprising things that we found for ourselves was that when you look at the literature in, on West Africa, we, we talk about a high associational life for women, and yet in our studies we were finding out that many religion had taken the place of much of the associational life. So, whereas in the past women had participated in community and workplace associations, etc., much of the associational life was now around in the church. At the same time, it's, it, it, we, we mustn't think that just because it is in the church that it was necessarily restrictive or conservative and that the church was now becoming the place where women learned the art of public speaking, managed to make new alliances, etc. So it was about also the changing role of religion in women's lives and how religion was becoming a resource because I think uh, West Africa and many African societies have become very religious in the last two or three decades, often as a, a reaction to very difficult economic conditions. But the, the church has now really grown. It's, it's like the, one of the few thriving industries uh, in many countries, you know, so it provided space, especially for women. Women are very much a large part of religious con congregations, I, I think, even here, maybe, but especially in, in Ghana and other places. And religion was now allowing women to do a lot more things, which, which also meant that if you really want to empower women, then you must also learn how to engage with the churches to challenge some of the more restrictive ideologies, especially with, with, with the coming of evangelical Christian sects uh, to many of the countries. In, in our work, we, we also looked at um, the changing representations of women in popular culture, and we did work with, uh, as I've said, with, uh, we, we, we looked at the song texts, more than 300 song texts from about over 50 years span. And then we started working with some of the practitioners. So we had workshops with the, the people who produce the music and tried to engage with them on the kinds of ideas. We, we had musical competitions. Unfortunately, we had fewer entries from women 
than men, and in the end, those who won the competition were men. You know, but, but still, we we began to perhaps um, introduce to them for the first time that the, the lyrics and the representations didn't need to be as negative as they could and as they were, and that because we found that women were usually objectified in the music and uh, especially through their bodies and they were often seen as lesser citizens, etc. So out of these findings, how do you begin to engage, to create much more positive representations of women? And, and we also found that um, these, the, these popular cultures were consumed very avidly and Often when we, when we talk about empowering women, we think about the material conditions, but we do not see the area of popular culture as an area for engagement to also begin to shape people's consciousness and to build this new critical consciousness that is important in any kind of, um, of um, project of, 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 um, of reconstruction. So, we, we, we concluded that culture and representations matter, both for people as well as for policymakers. People are trying to come up with much more positive changes around women and their capabilities. And that instead of ignoring them, that this was something that needed to be engaged with. Um, talk about the, the, the honorables and, and uh, I think that I will try to find a copy and, and let the institute have it. Now, um, in, in the last few months, I've been working on adolescents in West Africa, and, and I have tried to connect some of the work that we've done in women's empowerment to the conditions of these adolescents, because indeed, if, if we if all the talk about empowerment in both in the literature as well as in development practice has been successful, then it should be the young people who should be the beneficiaries. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case, and, and it shows you that um, the, the kinds of projects of empowerment have been really very limited, and that uh, the conditions of young women are still very difficult. And, unless we tackle them, then really the, the, the promise of empowerment for women um, are, are not likely to be realized. So of course, many more young women are getting an education compared to their mothers, etc. But beyond that, many of the conditions that they face are difficult. They're still very high adolescent fertility, great lack of access to um, information, especially around uh, the reproductive and, uh, and uh, rights generally. There's still a lot of high levels of, of uh, gender and sexual based violence around young girls. And that if, if, if we really are to realize these kinds of pathways for empowerment, they need to start very early with our young girls so that when they grow up, it then does not become a struggle for them. So again, it, it's back to the areas of not just providing the material resources, the schooling, etc., but more actively engaging in building this critical consciousness. And to some extent also for more of the women's rights organizations to engage with younger girls and, and try to deal with them. Not not just as victims, but really as as, as people who really need to be to become conscious of their rights and to make the kinds of changes that are necessary in their society. And I mean I had not of course at the time when we were doing the, the pathways project we had not worked with young people but my own recent work with um, adolescents helped me to make those kinds of connections that if we really are going to have the change, if it's if if these young women are going to be able to be fully represented in political life and decision making, it has to start much earlier on when they are still young people rather than when they fully grow and have really imbibed many of the gender emotions of 
their roles and their possibilities than you know uh, getting at it when they're so very young. Um, I think I'm going to leave it here because I wanted to kind of bring it back to, to young people and show the kinds of, of connections. And, and I would say that, the, the, as I said, this is a journey, it's not a destination. And for me, the fact that our young women are still facing many of these difficulties clearly shows that, you know, we have not yet arrived, that this is a, a journey of many years and that we, we do need to rethink our methods, we, we need to think of how we're going to make progress with our young people to ensure that the kinds of conditions that do not enable women to fulfill themselves first, because again, when you look at the, the development discourse and much of the literature, it's about development, you know, but, but let's start with people and their, themselves and their rights. And then, once those are actualized, the kinds of links to development can, can follow instead of instrumentalizing everything and seeing people as important only for development. So I hope that um, this has not, as it was a journey, so we, we've gone to, to many places, and, but I hope that there has been some coherence and, you know, I will be, I will take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yes. So I, I believe I heard two themes that, that you would say might be effective. And one had to do with the social structures, women's, women's groups that can have, make a difference. Um, and then I forgot the other. <laughs> uh, but, but two fundamental themes um, that have come to me. Did you, did you find that those were characteristic across the many different countries and cultures? The same uh, basic themes? Education didn't seem like one of them, but, but, but role models um, and the media, I guess that's the other one, being able to, to um, change how women are portrayed in, in movies and, and songs. Are those the two things across many, many different countries and cultures that you can see as most effective? I think education is definitely one of them. I I said that education was necessary, but it's not sufficient. Not sufficient. Yes. And uh, yes, the, the whole idea of women organizing for themselves, the, the social structures, it's, it's, it's not just about not. Once you start talking about not, there's something almost debilitating about it. But what you found is that across the different countries, Women have just accepted their conditions. They were trying to do things to change. And often, um, like in Brazil, when you had state systems that were supporting, that helped a lot too, because it helped to pass laws, etc. But again, that you could pass a law and it wouldn't, it wouldn't, you know, so for instance, if we, we, we went, we compared the, the the Maria Pena law in Brazil with the domestic violence law in Ghana, and we found that because at the time Brazil was very much more progressive, government set up police stations for women and the like, that the law was being more aggressively implemented than in our context, for instance, where we had a law all right, where the resources were not necessarily available. So what, what this shows is that it's not one thing that is necessary, that you need to work on different fronts at the same time. That you need the laws, you need education, you need a consciousness, you know, and you need the, the, the collective actions to make the, the progress that is necessary. Yeah. One thing we notice, and, and you can see it in some extent in the Me Too movement, is that Young women are very. Um, they have. They haven't learned about the, the people that went before and dealt with some of these same issues. Do you, do you find that situation true in Ghana or some of the other um, countries that uh, when they're coming out of school, they, it's as if no one has ever spoken to them about these issues before? Yes and no. I mean, we we've been having. Um, 
gather now, we have these uh, young women's movements and we've been struggling with them. One of them is called Pepe Nam. Pepe Nam. It's almost like put Pepe in the, no, the eye, put Pepe in the eyes of men. Like men are the problem and they, they need to be contested, you know. And, uh, and then we've got all kinds of movements. So we've got a lot of them called Sugar Them and Papa Them. So some people say, yes. Men have a problem, but the way to deal with them is to, yeah, make them feel comfortable and then get your way. You know, so we, it was irritating, but we, we've, had, we've learned to engage with them. So we, we've been trying to have some of these intergenerational dialogues precisely to, to, to make the point that these issues are not new and that other people have dealt with them. But, you know, so it's, it's, it's intergenerational struggle, so you are old fashioned and you did it this way. You know. but, but I think the challenge is us also to find ways of working with younger women because you know they don't feel isolated, sometimes they don't you know, necessarily know about what other people are doing. So how, how do we communicate across how do we work in, in the schools and in communities to really make them feel that yes, there are supporting um, groups that, that can help them. And, and that is where the, the issue of that, where do you also get the chance to, to do all this work comes in. So you have to be innovative, you have to find ways to do things more with less and, 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 and not to give up because otherwise it's like everybody destined to reinvent in the wheel. So it is challenging, but it's not impossible. I think it, it, it means that you have to rethink your methods of work. And also get a little more sound with social media in the line, because they're using social media a lot. So how do you use social media to get around some of these things? And, and of course, there is, we're talking not only about young people who are in school, but those who are out of school who face some of these problems in a much more difficult way. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I'm a graduate student, student in the School of Education, and I think a lot about how, um, like what are the limitation possibilities of using education to empower um, youth of color in poverty. And one thing that you mentioned that stood out to me is um, the distinction between enabling women in their poverty versus like um, empowering them. And I wonder like how do you make the shift from um, doing work that's not simply enabling um, the communities of the margins but like actually empowering them? And how how do you get there? Yeah, that's interesting because I, I think that um, often groups that where the women care too much, you know, like uh, you do something and, and it helps, you have to solve all the problems. And, and, and what, what has happened in many countries is that working with groups, especially with donor funds, has created dependency so that it's like but the power of persons who arise and come to the babies instead of letting people know that the strength is actually in themselves and that we really an enabler. And it's also about, so since you are in the place, it's also about knowledge and power and who knows about the conditions, you know. So I think that the whole development industry has been built around you know, the powerless and the more powerful and more the more the less knowledge. So it's really also a difference in approach, you know, in, in, in the same communities know that indeed they, they do know about their conditions. So sometimes when you want to be very close to something, it's difficult to step back and analyze it. You know. So um, I think it's it's a much more reflexive position and also about how do you develop more participatory ways of the communities and groups instead of feeling that I am the one who can do anything for you so that the, the fact that you are able to help you continue along for themselves. Yes, it gives them clean water and solve them, but you really 
it's, it's, it's a need that you have satisfied. And I think sometimes because you're dealing with very poor environment, when you give a need, you make it into something more than it is. Yes, you say that the, the drudgery of having to work for months is a matter. But it's also about a rice perspective, because these are things that we're entitled to as citizens in you. But, but often the, the kind of discourse does not really bring out the citizenship rights to you and what it is that people are entitled to. So you, this is where the, the, the fashion always affects you. Know, you are the, the, the big person who brings development to people. So really helping them to realize what is their right. Yeah. And it's um, looking at your your pathways and mm -hmm. how people uh, imagine their journeys on the pathways and, and wondering about the, the role of role models. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in our you mentioned social media mm -hmm. and uh, in in our world today I mean, there, there there seems to be such an odd combination of people trusting their friends and then trusting people who are so far away. And, and, so, and, and then you mentioned uh, multi-generational multi you know, like histories and stories as well. So I was curious if you've seen any patterns at all in, in how, how the young women, who are their role models? Are they people they, they actually know? Are they people they've seen in the media? Are they people who are you know, bouncing, bouncing around? I mean, uh, are they famous people, or, or uh, have you seen, noticed any, any habits at all? No, they, they, in Ghana, they do this, uh, I don't know what to call them, they, people kind of select who, who are the, yeah, the role models that you mentioned. Certainly, you as a university professor will not be a role model. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is more likely to be an actress. You yeah. Know? Right. And, and, and that is why some of our work with, with the popular culture artists seeks to find ways to make them much more conscious of themselves because they are people who are looked up to and it's, they are people who select who they want to look up to. But it's important that the messages that come from them are empowering, not you know, messages that really subjugate them. And, and that is what is occasioning some of our attempts at working with popular artists so that they are able to, 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 to come up with much more positive images for younger women. So that it's not just women who talk to themselves that they try to just please men, but you know, really find ways to tell young people that you know, your, your goals and you, know, you, you can achieve what you want to to be as a concept, just be glamorous and not think about So it's, it's, it's uh, multifaceted, you know, and, and, and I guess the role models for people who are in secondary school may be very different from role models for people who are at university or for people who, are, who don't have any schooling, etc. You know, so again, you, you have to wait on so many different fronts and, and our engagement with the, the Nollywood film industry is motivated by that. This is a very popular genre and, and people really they feast on them, they, they really devour them. You know, so we were thinking that we could work with these people so that women are not sort of really very weak and negative roles. You know, of messages that would be feed out to their audiences, especially young women, would be much more positive and empowering instead of seeing women as dependent on men. And, you know, in, in contexts where work, work situations are very dicey, economic dependency is very real, and with economic dependency comes relations of some salience and abuse as a So how do you Manage. And, and it doesn't mean that you have to be rich before you can just um, you know the, that irrespective of work that uh, you, can, you can still have a lot of dependence. You know? So how 
how do we really find ways to, 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 to change these, these kinds of conceptions, the intended notions, the, the socialization that people go through? It's, it's those are the kinds of things. And through some of the international dialogues also, how do you then begin to, to find ways to, to